Welcome to another Kent Seminar meeting. Today, or series, sorry. Today we have Kazi Castorena. I have the great, great pleasure of introducing her. She's an associate professor at NC State. And before that, she did her, <clears throat> her bachelor's, master's, and doctoral degrees in the University of Wisconsin. She has a lot of, of uh, papers related and research related to Experiment, the experimental characterization, modeling of acyl binders, emulsions, mastics, and mixtures. I am personally a very big follower of all the LAS development, and I am really interested in it. So I am very excited for today's presentation. Um, so without any further delay, Professor Castarena, uh, the, the audience is yours. Um, well, just before we, we get started, I just wanted to remind everyone that you can use the Q&A button. You can ask questions on the chat at the end of the presentation, which is going to be 40 minutes long. We will promote everybody to panelists so that we ha can have a discussion and we can help the moderators that you can see, Lama, uh, Isaac and me. We can moderate the questions and help you deliver them to, to the speaker or we can allow you to speak. So Professor Castorena. It's all you now. Thank you for being here. Okay. Well, thank you everyone for attending today's seminar. Uh, and thank you to the organizing committee for extending the kind invitation uh, to share some of our, our work with you. Um, so in today's presentation, I'll be discussing uh, work that my research group has conducted uh, towards advancing performance graded asphalt binder specifications. Um, so at the time that ASHTO M320 uh, performance graded specifications were developed, uh, our asphalts that we used were quite different than those which we use today. Um, since that time, uh, asphalt production processes have evolved. Um, we have also increased the amount of recycled materials, including wrap and RAS that we use in our mixtures. Um, and we now routinely use a wide array of additives uh, within our asphalt binders. Um, consequently, it's been demonstrated quite um, thoroughly that our current specification often fails to discriminate among the performance of today's binders. Uh, with respect to rutting resistance, uh, we've greatly improved our ability to screen uh, today's binders uh, against this distress uh, through the introduction of the multiple stress creep and recovery or MSCR test and the associated performance grading specification ASHTO M332. However, our critical shortcomings remain with respect to addressing durability within our specifications and with respect to how to uh, select an appropriate virgin binder to use in combination with a uh, wrap and or RAS. Um, so aligned with those shortcomings, uh, I've identified three critical questions. Uh, does the pressure aging vessel uh, procedure that we use um, for long-term aging of asphalt binders in our spe specifications actually simulate prolonged field aging? Um, how can we characterize the cracking resistance of asphalt binders and how much of the recycled binder in an asphalt mixture actually mobilizes and blends with the virgin binder? Uh, the first two questions are critical to answer to uh, address uh, durability within our specifications. Uh, the latter question uh, is critical to understanding virgin binder selection in, in RAP and RAS mixes. Uh, most of our current approaches uh, assume uh, complete blending between the materials, uh, which many have speculated is inaccurate. Um, so in this presentation, um, I will share uh, analysis that my research group has conducted in light of these three questions. Um, I won't be able to answer uh, completely what our future specification should look like, but I hope that the knowledge I share helps us at least uh, move in the right direction. Um, so correspondingly, uh, I've broken this presentation down into three topics. Um, the first will be the relationship between the PAV and field age levels. Um, I'll then discuss the using the dynamic shearometer or DSR uh, to characterize fatigue cracking resistance. Uh, and the last topic I'll cover is observations of blending uh, in an asphalt mixture containing recycled materials. Okay, so starting with the first topic, relating the PAV to corresponding field age levels. Um, so we uh, related the extent of aging uh, achieved within the standard pressure aging vessel or PAV procedure to 
corresponding field age levels uh, throughout the United States uh, using two links. Uh, the first link uh, related the extensive aging achieved using the PAV to the corresponding loose mix of an aging duration at 95 degrees Celsius uh, to achieve the same extent of aging. And in our analysis, we uh, assess the extent of aging uh, based on the rheology of the asphalt binder. Uh, we utilize this link because this loose mix of an aging procedure uh, was developed under NCHRP 9-54. Uh, in that project led by Dr. Richard Kim at NC State, we also uh, established a link between the corresponding loose mix of an aging duration and the extent of field aging achieved uh, as a function of hourly pavement temperature history and depth below the pavement surface. So we could use these links to relate the PAV to approximate field aging levels. Um, I should mention one limitation of the study. Uh, we only considered a single PAV aging temperature of 100 degrees Celsius. Um, we selected that temperature because it's the most commonly used uh, in practice. Um, a little bit of background on the NCHRP uh, Project 9-54 long-term aging procedure calibration, um, since uh, that's a, a key aspect of, of this analysis we conducted. Um, it encompassed 30 field sections, and for each of those field sections, um, we had field cores from in-service pavements, and we had the original component materials used to construct those field sections. Uh, this allowed us to relate uh, the duration of laboratory of an aging of the loose mixture um, to corresponding field age levels as a function of depth in the field core. Um, and we did that on the basis of the rheology of the extracted and recovered binders from the laboratory prepared materials and field cores. Um, we did this for 30 different field sections. Um, they were uh, from diverse climate uh, locations. Uh, the locations from which we source these materials um, are shown in blue on the map. Um, we analyzed multiple field cores per project location to try to encompass representative results and expected field variability. Um, the span in terms of age level we considered was four and 21 years in terms of our field cores. Uh, and we encompassed a broad range of materials. We had hot mix, warm mix, polymer modified asphalt or PMA uh, in wrap sections. Uh, and the result of that calibration uh, was what we refer to as the climatic aging index or CAI. Uh, this climatic aging index relates the laboratory of an aging duration in terms of days uh, that need to be applied to loose mix conditioned at 95 degrees Celsius to match a given level of age field, uh, field aging in terms of hourly pavement temperature history and depth below the pavement surface. Okay. Um, so this CAI was derived using a simplification of an oxidation kinetics model um, where we retained the exponential relationship uh, between temperature and the rate of oxidation. Uh, and the coefficients or the numbers you see in this expression, those were calibrated based on those 30 field sections I mentioned in the previous slide. Um, so we use that in combination with uh, our link between the PAV aging procedure and corresponding duration uh, of loose mix conditioning to achieve the same rheology. Um, and I'm showing those relationships here for two PAV age levels. Uh, the first is the standard PAV procedure, 20 hours of conditioning. Uh, and the second is the 40 hour PAV procedure. I've included this one um, because that's become quite popular uh, in recent years um, because many have suspected that the standard procedure doesn't actually mimic prolonged field aging. Um, so for the 20 hour PAV uh, aging procedure, uh, we found that uh, it equated to the same uh, extent of aging as two days of loose mixture oven conditioning at 95 degrees Celsius. Again, we do see some scatter, but it's, it's approximately uh, along the line of equality here. Uh, in the case of the 40 hour PAV aging procedure, it equates to roughly six days uh, of loose mixture conditioning, okay? Um, so on the basis of these links in the CAI in the previous slide, uh, we were able to generate maps of the United States uh, depicting uh, the extent of field aging achieved by both the 20 hour and 40 hour PAV procedures. Um, for this analysis, uh, we analyzed the weather station data from the 2800 Mira 2 
weather stations that are available. Uh, and we process that weather data through the enhanced integrated climatic model in order to obtain the hourly pavement temperature history. Um, we use that in conjunction with our CAI um, to calculate the equivalent field age levels. Um, and for this analysis, we only considered one depth um, of six millimeters below the pavement surface. Uh, we chose that depth um, because it reflects the most severe uh, aging condition. The surface ages the most where the temperatures uh, are highest. Okay, so the first map I'm going to show you uh, is here, uh, and it depicts the approximate field age level achieved by the 20 hour PAV procedure. Again, we considered a single depth of six millimeters here. Um, we can see from this map uh, that the extent of field aging achieved by this procedure varies drastically uh, with location in the United States. We see for very cold regions, depicted by the dark red color here, uh, the extent of aging simulated probably exceeds what we'd ever see in a pavement. Uh, it simulates more than 22 years of field aging. Um, in contrast, in much of the southern United States, this blue area here, we're only simulating two to four years of field aging. Okay. Um, and so this just highlights uh, the complexity of, of understanding oxidation kinetics um, and an inference is made based on PAV aged binders. Uh, here's the map that we generated uh, using the 40 hour uh, PAV aging duration. Uh, here we see, as we would expect, uh, more severe uh, field age levels are achieved. Um, we see for much of the northern United States, kind of in this orangish color here, we're probably hitting right about where we want to. We're simulating 11 to 14 years of field aging. However, for much of the southern United States, we're still not simulating uh, really prolonged field aging. We see we're falling on the order of four to eight years. Okay. Uh, so collectively, uh, this analysis is, is highlighting the importance of uh, developing a climate-specific long-term aging procedure. Uh, we saw that the extent of aging achieved by uh, the PAV varies drastically with our climatic locations. Now, the standard PAV procedure does include provisions for three aging temperatures, uh, depending on the climate. Um, however, there's a lot of leniency and loud in terms of which temperature you choose. Um, and the, therefore, the majority of agencies are currently using 100 degrees. Um, furthermore, based on the diverse climates we have in the United States, having only three different age levels uh, may be insufficient. Um, now, there is hope for overcoming this shortcoming uh, through the recently completed NCHRP Project 9-61, uh, where they uh, worked at establishing a refined PAV aging procedure um, that allows for simulating um, field aging as a function of climatic conditions, retaining the 20 hour durations we currently have in our specifications. Um, so I'm hopeful uh, this will give us a tool uh, to more uh, effectively reflect prolonged field aging in our future specifications. Okay. Um, so that's all I'm going to share uh, on uh, relating the PAV to field aging. Uh, the next topic uh, I'm going to discuss is using the dynamic shear rheometer uh, to characterize uh, the fatigue cracking resistance of asphalt binders. So the Ashto M320 and M332 um, performance graded specifications for asphalt binder both rely on linear viscoelastic uh, parameters uh, to indicate cracking performance. Linear viscoelastic parameters are measured at small strain and under very few loading cycles. Uh, therefore, they don't actually quantify cracking resistance. Consequently, uh, it's been demonstrated that our current specification parameter for fatigue resistance, uh, which is G star time sine delta, uh, does not relate to mixture cracking performance when you consider both modified and unmodified binders together. Uh, this was first brought to light through NCHRP project 9-10, and I'm showing here on the left-hand graph the relationship that they observed between our current specification parameter and mixture fatigue life. And this encompassed both polymer modified and unmodified binders. Now that's only one linear viscoelastic parameters. Other linear viscoelastic parameters have similar limitations. Um, so one of the other linear viscoelastic parameters uh, that's been given quite a bit of attention in recent years for uh, being an indicator of cracking resistance is the so-called Glover row parameter. Uh, this parameter was developed uh, under the assumption that 
this linear viscoelastic base parameter we could quantify using the DSR uh, correlates with ductility, which is inherently a failure property that has some, um, you know, understandable relationships to cracking resistance. Now, in Glover's original work uh, that proposed this parameter, uh, he demonstrated a high correlation between ductility utility and the Glover row parameter that was material independent when you considered only unmodified asphalts. When he considered polymer modified asphalts, which is what I'm showing in the right hand graph, the relationship between ductility and the linear viscoelastic parameter or surrogate, the so called Glover row parameter, it's material specific, meaning that when we have modified binders, we can't reflect failure properties using linear viscoelastic parameters. This highlights the need to actually quantify inherent cracking resistance. Uh, we can utilize the DSR, uh, the same tool we use to measure G star time sign delta to characterize actual cracking resistance of asphalt binders. Um, there's two tests that have been utilized for this purpose. Uh, they include the time sweep test and the linear amplitude sweep or LAS test. Uh, the time sweep test is a more or less conventional fatigue test. Uh, it consists of constant stress or strain amplitude loading. Uh, and we monitor the change in the materials loading resistance with respect to number of loading cycles uh, to infer damage growth within the specimen. Uh, this is a nice test in that it's relatively um, simple uh, to, to understand uh, damage growth in the test. Um, however, it's not really compatible with use in routine specifications. And that's because of uncertainty in the test duration uh, and correspondingly selection of the test uh, loading amplitude to ensure failure in a reasonable amount of time. The only way to know what we should choose is to have prior knowledge um, of the binders cracking resistance. And we don't typically have that uh, at the time of performance grading. Um, and that's why this LAS test was introduced. Uh, the LAS test also uses oscillatory loading, um, but in this case, uh, we ratchet up uh, the, the strain amplitude uh, to accelerate the rate of damage uh, incurred in the asphalt binder sample. Um, so using this loading sequence, we use much higher strains and we've uh, been able to induce failure in all of the samples we've studied within five minutes. And so that makes it more compatible um, with our um, performance graded specification type of framework. Um, so what actually happens to the asphalt binder in these uh, asphalt binder DSR tests? Um, what happens when we're using the parallel plate geometry that's most commonly used um, in our performance graded specifications um, what we see is that we get cracks that emanate from the periphery of the sample and propagate inward. Uh, this is somewhat intuitive because the parallel plate geometry uh, imposes a radial strain gradient. The strain is zero at the specimen center and it increases linearly to a maximum value at the edge. So we get damage growth from the outward inward in the sample. Uh, this is evident by uh, the photo I've shown here. Uh, so the photo on the left uh, shows a sample still in the DSR right after a fatigue test. Um, from this view, it's not really evident what happened to the sample in the test. Um, however, if we were to freeze the sample and raise the spindle um, and then look at the binder that remains um, adhered to the plate, uh, this is the sort of morphology that we see. And these uh, radial lines are evidence of cracks that grew from the periphery and propagated towards the center of the specimen. And now the way that we infer this crack growth um, using the DSR is to track the loading resistance. So in the case of strain controlled oscillatory loading, we monitor the stress amplitude response with respect to number of loading cycles. It decays, uh, indicating uh, we're losing loading resistance due to this uh, crack that's growing and propagating inward. Um, it's been demonstrated that the, the time sweep test uh, does a very good job at discriminating uh, among different binders uh, inherent fatigue resistance. Um, so I've depicted that on, in this slide with two graphs. The left hand graph shows uh, the fatigue life or number of cycles to failure uh, measured in time sweep tests conducted at two strain amplitudes, 2% uh, and 3% for two unmodified asphalts uh, designated A and B here. And these two uh, asphalts modified by several different polymers. 
Um, and what we see is, as one would expect, the polymer modified materials show better uh, fatigue resistance or a higher fatigue life. Um, and also, we see that the test is sensitive to the modifier used and the modifier base binder interaction. Okay. Uh, furthermore, it's been demonstrated that the results of time sweep tests uh, in terms of fatigue life measurements uh, are correlated with corresponding mixture fatigue life measurements. Um, so the right hand graph was taken from NCHRP project 9 10, um, where they saw a poor correlation between these same mixture performance test results and our current fatigue specification. When they used the time sweep test, uh, they saw a, a good correlation uh, with an R squared of roughly 0.8. Okay. Um, so in the case of the linear amplitude sweep, uh, it constitutes a relatively unrealistic loading history. It has a ratcheting strain amplitude that goes to very, very high strain. So when we, when we interpret the LAS test results, we want to translate those into something more like the time sweep test, okay? Like the fatigue life under a certain strain amplitude condition. Um, to do that, we've utilized the simplified viscoelastic continuum damage model or SVECD model framework. Um, we adapted this largely from uh, the same framework that's been applied to asphalt mixtures extensively. Okay. Um, this model includes two primary components, uh, a damage characteristic curve function and a failure criterion function. Um, these two functions can be calibrated using very limited uh, test results, uh, such as linear amplitude sweep test results. Um, and used to predict um, fatigue performance under varying conditions of interest. So for example, we can use the LAS test results and we can predict what would have happened um, in time sweep tests of varying strains. Okay, so it's a very powerful um, tool for us to, to leverage uh, in our fatigue characterization. Um, so one application of using this SVCD model um, that we've used quite extensively in our work uh, is to uh, derive a closed form solution of the relationship between our fatigue life and F and our applied strain amplitude denoted as gamma here. Okay. Um, now we've evaluated prediction accuracies um, using this model framework uh, when we calibrate the SVCD model using time sweep tests and try to predict other time sweep tests. And when we calibrate it using LAS test results and use it to predict time sweep test. The left hand graph uh, depicts our prediction accuracy for four binders, two modified, two unmodified. Um, when we calibrate the SVCD model using time sweep results and then use it to predict uh, other time sweep results. And when we do that, we see very, very good prediction accuracy. You see all of our data points here fall along the line of equality. When we calibrate the SVECD model using linear amplitude sweep test results alone and use those to predict the time sweep, um, what we've seen is, is the relationship in the right-hand graph. We see that the relationship between the measured fatigue lives and the predicted fatigue lives are highly correlated. However, there is a bias. We see a bias from the line of equality. The reason for that bias is inherent viscoelastic nonlinearity that's induced simultaneously with damage in the linear amplitude sweep test. As we ratchet up the strain, uh, the material's modulus reduces due to viscoelastic nonlinearity. Its loading resistance also reduces due to the growth of cracks. So it's very difficult to differentiate these two phenomena. Okay. Um, however, the results do suggest uh, quite good promise, even when we, need, need, we neglect the effects of viscoelastic nonlinearity for um, reflecting mixture cracking performance. Um, in this slide here, I've shown the uh, observations of the relationship between binder damage characteristic curves and mixture damage characteristic curves. Um, here we see very similar trends in terms of where uh, the materials curves fall. Um, and we've also used the LAS test results coupled with the SVECD model um, to generate fatigue life predictions that correlate well with measurements of field fatigue life um, at the Federal Highway Administration's accelerated loading facility. Okay. Um, so we've seen uh, quite promising results that we can capture um, at least a rank uh, relative cracking resistance of different binders using this framework.
Um, so that's a lot of good things about uh, DSR fatigue test. Um, what are some challenges associated uh, with conducting and interpreting uh, the test results? Um, one challenge in conducting the test is that um, we want to induce cohesive cracking within our sample. We want to induce that, um, those radial cracks that I mentioned in the previous slides. Um, however, because our binder is viscoelastic, uh, if we test at too high of a temperature or too low of a frequency, what we get is flow rather than fracture. Um, so if we conduct our test at relatively high temperatures, uh, if we look at our sample in the DSR after the test, we see clear evidence of what we refer to as edge flow. In contrast, if we test at too low of a temperature or too high of a frequency where our binder is very brittle, um, we experience challenges with adhesive failure where we lose bond between the sample and the DSR plate. Um, or what I'm going to refer to as, as falling, or essentially the material is so brittle it just kind of crumbles and falls apart. Now we've studied the relationship between uh, the undamaged properties of the material and the, the failure mechanism that we see in the test. And what we found is that there's a certain modulus range uh, for PAV age binders that works pretty well. Um, and that falls within the uh, temperature of the average of the high and the low temperature performance grades minus four degrees Celsius, okay? Um, however, um, this rule doesn't work if we have different aging conditions. And so uh, one area that I think merits further research is defining appropriate uh, test conditions for more severe age levels, especially given that our uh, new long-term aging procedure that may come out of NCHRP project 9-61 may push us in that direction, okay? Um, another limitation that I already mentioned uh, is that in the LAS test, we get both uh, damage and nonlinear viscoelasticity uh, leading to apparent modulus reductions in the test. Um, and using LAS test results alone, it's really impossible to differentiate uh, nonlinear viscoelasticity from damage. Um, another criticism that's been raised uh, of the DSR uh, parallel plate geometry test uh, is the non-uniform distribution of damage. Um, as we saw, because the strain's non-uniform, crack growth happens from the outer edge of the specimen to the inner uh, portion of the specimen. Um, now we've studied these two phenomena extensively um, and we've developed methodologies to rigorously account for the effects of viscoelastic nonlinearity uh, and uh, inhomogeneous damage growth uh, in the test. Um, and these have been validated using Conan plate or CP test um, where we have uniform damage growth um, and uniform strain within our sample. Um, however, uh, the methodologies that we were able to establish, at least at this point, um, require more extensive testing than the LAS alone. And therefore, I would deem the testing um, more cumbersome than is practical for routine use. Um, so to summarize um, our work on um, asphalt binder uh, cracking resistance, um, I feel that linear viscoelastic parameters um, are insufficient for uh, discriminating among the cracking resistance of asphalt binders in use today, primarily when we have unmodified and polymer modified binders. Um, we've demonstrated that oscillatory parallel plate dynamic shear rheometer testing can be used to characterize and predict the cracking resistance of asphalt binders. Um, now, we've shown quite promising results when we neglect uh, the effects of viscoelastic nonlinearity. Um, however, I think this is an area that merits further investigation. Uh, I also think that we need to uh, define uh, more robustly what our test uh, temperature uh, selection procedure should look like for more severe age levels. Okay, so I would say that the implications of test temperature and nonlinear viscoelasticity uh, on our inferences of damage resistance merit additional research prior to implementation of these sort of tools into practice. Okay, um, so the last topic that I'm going to discuss uh, within this presentation uh, is the observations of blending in an asphalt mixture containing recycled materials. Um, so currently we have a pretty poor understanding uh, of blending between uh, virgin and recycled materials within asphalt mixtures. Um, we don't really know uh, to what extent the recycled material acts like a black rock as opposed to the binder melting, mobilizing, and blending with the virgin asphalt. 
Um, so we've been trying to help answer uh, this question. Um, and, and to do so, we had to find a way to differentiate the virgin binder from the recycled binder within asphalt mixtures. Um, if we just look in a typical asphalt mixture, it's uh, impossible to differentiate the virgin and the recycled binders uh, from one another uh, on the basis of color or composition. Uh, so to circumvent this challenge, um, we've utilized a tracer within our virgin binder. Um, we add a titanium dioxide uh, microparticle um, to the virgin binder using a high shear mill, which produces a very stable blend uh, prior to fabricating our asphalt mixture samples. Okay, um, So this titanium dioxide tracer, uh, it appears white uh, in a powder form, um, and we add that to the virgin binder prior to making our mixture samples. Uh, the inclusion of this tracer uh, allows us to make visual inferences um, of unblended recycled um, binder within asphalt mixtures uh, on the basis of color and on the basis of elemental composition. Uh, so the titanium dioxide, as I showed in the previous slide, is white. And so what happens when we add it to the virgin binder is that it turns it a brown hue. Uh, this means when we make our asphalt mixture samples uh, and we look at them, uh, any of the binder matrix containing virgin binder appears brown. Um, and we've been able to see color contrast between that brown color and black uh, binder, indicating unrecycled binder, uh, very clearly uh, by taking photos of submerged asphalt mixture samples. We submerge them in water before taking the photos uh, to remove the influence of glare and best allow for color contrast. So I've just shown an example of one of those submerged photos here. Uh, you can see uh, a lot of brown area uh, indicating we know within that area of the binder matrix there's some virgin binder. There may be recycled binder as well, but we at least know there's virgin binder. Uh, and then where we see black areas, such as this large cluster under this star, um, we know that we have unblended recycled binder. Okay? So this would be a cluster uh, of adhered uh, RAP or RAS particles together. Um, also, we can use energy dispersive X-ray spectroscopy scanning electron microscopy, or EDS-SEM for brevity, um, to infer um, the location of unblended recycled binder uh, on the basis of, of elemental tracking or mapping. Um, so EDS-SEM allows us to map uh, the uh, presence of different elements uh, on a sample surface. Um, so I've shown here an EDS map, which we call a layered map, that includes all of the elements that were present. So in this image here, uh, the blue-green areas indicate aggregates, and the darker areas indicate our binder matrix. We can track the location of the binder matrix uh, just using the sulfur. So um, at least for all of the binders we've studied, they have uh, sufficient sulfur concentration uh, that we can clearly detect where there's, there's binder by mapping sulfur distribution. Now, if we just look at sulfur, all we know is that binder's there. It could be recycled or it could be virgin. Um, to differentiate um, the recycled and virgin binders from one another, uh, we look at the distribution of titanium. Titanium is not naturally present in asphalt binders. And so by looking at where the titanium is, we know where the virgin binder is, okay? So in this map here, um, we see the pattern of the titanium matches the pattern of sulfur above the dashed line. This indicated we know virgin binder is present there. There could be recycled binder as well, um, but we know um, there's all, at a minimum there's virgin binder. If we look below the line, uh, we see a strong sulfur signal in the, the sulfur map, but we don't see uh, a clear titanium signal. So this would indicate below the line, a region of unblended recycled binder. Uh, in addition to those qualitative visual inferences, uh, we can make quantitative inferences of recycled binder contribution using EDS-SEM. EDS-SEM allows us to determine not only uh, generate maps of where elements are, we can quantify uh, the concentration of different elements present at different locations within our sample. Uh, we can use that to, to calculate what I'm referring to in this presentation as the recycled binder contribution, or RBC. Uh, that's the percentage of the total recycled binder within the virgin binder matrix. So an RBC of zero would indicate there's no uh, RAT binder or RAS binder uh, mixed with the virgin binder matrix. We're only seeing virgin binder. Uh, an RBC of 100 would 
coincide with a completely blended scenario. We see the concentration of recycled binder, um, assuming all of it mobilized and blended with the virgin. Um, this calculation is performed using the equation shown. Uh, it involves measuring the titanium and sulfur concentrations within uh, our location of interest. Um, it requires input of the total asphalt content and recycled asphalt content, and it requires normalization for differences in sulfur content of the virgin binder and the recycled binder in the mix. Um, so within this presentation, um, I'm going to show you our observations of blending uh, in a single asphalt mixture uh, following the methodology I presented. Uh, this mixture is from the state of North Carolina. Uh, it's a nine and a half millimeter NMAS mix. Uh, it contained 25% RAF, 4% uh, RAS, um, and based on that uh, distribution, it had an RBR or bi recycled binder replacement ratio of 29%. About half of that came from the RAF and about half of it came from the RAS. Um, and this mix contained a PG58 minus 28 virgin binder. Um, we um, fabricated our samples um, for our analysis um, by first preparing laboratory mix, laboratory compacted gyratory samples. Um, and then we extracted what I refer to as small test specimens from the gyratories. Um, these test specimens were 38 millimeters in diameter uh, by 110 millimeters tall. Um, we subjected those extracted specimens to cyclic fatigue loading in an asphalt mixture uh, performance tester. And we did this to failure. Uh, the reason that we did this is we wanted to compare uh, the distribution of recycled and virgin materials in the bulk of the mixture um, to that along the fracture surface. Okay. Um, so to make inferences of uh, the bulk material distributions, uh, we sawed um, specimens um, and inspected sawn surfaces. And then to look at how that was different from the fracture surface, um, we analyzed the fracture surface itself. Okay. Um, sawn surfaces were pretty easy to analyze. Um, sawing creates a smooth surface, which is what we need for EDS SEM. So we simply polished that surface and could look at it. The fracture surface, as you can see from this photo, is quite rough. Um, so to allow for uh, imaging using the EDS SEM, uh, we encased it in a clear epoxy, okay? And then we sliced through that epoxy and we imaged at the interface between the epoxy and the fracture surface. Okay, so next I'm gonna show you our observations. Uh, first, I'm gonna show you our visual observations. Um, Looking on the right first, uh, this coincides with the sawn specimen surface. Um, so this is representative of what exists in the bulk material. Um, what we saw was clear evidence of unblended clusters of recycled material. Um, so I've circled a few of these in yellow here. Um, and we can see clear evidence that they're, they're black and in contrast from the brown matrix containing uh, at least some uh, virgin binder. Now, our inference from these observations uh, is that these clusters are essentially adheres or agglomerates of reclaimed materials that were not broken down during crushing operations um, to, pr to uh, re produce the, the RAP and RAS for incorporation in this mix. And they also didn't break down when we heated the material up and mixed it with the virgin materials. So we were very interested in seeing, uh, do these clusters persist uh, on uh, the fracture surface? And essentially what we observed is they don't, at least for this mix. Uh, it's a little bit harder to see uh, on the fracture surface because this was encased in the epoxy. So that's why there's some bubbles evident. But essentially what we saw was uh, a very brown and uniform color uh, indicating no uh, clusters were present. This suggested uh, at least in this mix that we analyzed the cracks propagated around uh, the, the clusters and through uh, the, the virgin binder uh, matrix that contained, uh, or we speculated contained some amount of recycled binder. Um, so to uh, learn more about what was going on on the fracture surface, uh, we looked at the elemental composition uh, of the material along the fracture surface. Um, we looked both at the EDS SEM maps uh, and quantitative calculations of the recycled binder contribution. Um, the elemental maps really confirmed our visual observations. Uh, we essentially saw wherever we saw titanium or sulfur present, we saw titanium present. 
indicating there was virgin binder um, present everywhere in the, in the binder matrix along the fracture surface. Um, I'm showing three maps here, but we looked at um, many more than that. This is just an illustrative, three illustrative maps. Um, I show, I've shown our calculated recycled binder contribution uh, values as a function of location we looked at um, in the right-hand graph. Now, this is uh, locations within a single um, asphalt mixture sample that we fatigue fractured, okay? Um, and what we see is considerable variation, indicating this blending problem is quite complex. Um, we see anywhere from near 0%, indicating pure virgin binder, uh, up to about 85%, uh, indicating uh, that roughly we have 85% of the expected uh, recycled binder in the matrix, 85% um, of what we would have assumed from complete blending. Um, the average that we saw in these 16 maps was right at 40%. Um, so this means for this mix, on average, uh, we only had 40% of the recycled binder within the virgin binder matrix along the fracture surface. This really brings into question the validity uh, of assuming complete blending in our virgin binder selection procedures. Uh, so to summarize uh, our observations, again, I'm only showing a single mix here. Um, we saw clusters of recycled materials. Uh, these clusters prohibited complete blending of the virgin and recycled binders uh, within the mixture evaluated. Uh, we saw that the fracture surface um, of the asphalt mixture uh, did not contain any of these clusters, uh, which we inferred meant that the fracture largely propagated uh, around these relatively hard inclusions. Uh, the binder matrix along the fracture surface uh, indicated an average recycled binder contribution of 40%, indicating that approximately 60% of the total recycled binder uh, did not blend with the virgin asphalt. Okay. Um, so some concluding remarks to, to wrap up this presentation. Um, we saw that the extent of field aging simulated by the standard 20 hour PAV uh, and the now popular 40 hour PAV procedures uh, varies considerably within the United States. Uh, this highlights the need for a climate specific long term aging procedure in our future specifications. Um, we also saw that damage characterization is needed to discriminate asphalt binder cracking resistance, and we can accomplish this using the dynamic shear rheometer. Uh, the effects of temperature, nonlinearity, and damage inhomogeneity on inferences of damage resistant, uh, in my opinion, merit additional research using a wide array of binders and long-term aging conditions uh, prior to implementing uh, this sort of test into practice. Um, lastly, um, we saw that selection of a virgin binder grade for use in combination with recycled materials under the assumption of complete blending may lead to a softer binder matrix in the asphalt mix than intended, and that's because we don't get complete blending. Um, the appropriate assumptions for recycled binder contribution uh, merit further investigation, and the EDS SEM tool I presented uh, offers a means to investigate this further. Um, so thank you all for your attention today. Um, I would like to acknowledge those who also contributed to this research, um, the current and former NC State researchers. Uh, I'm really blessed to work with a great team at NC State. Um, my colleagues Richard Kim and Shane Underwood uh, are wonderful to work with as well as our, our students. Um, and also this work was financially supported by the NCHRP, Federal Highway Administration and North Carolina Department of Transportation. So thank you all. Thank you, for Professor Castellana, for a very, very nice presentation. We have questions lined up for you. So we're going to start with uh, Professor Ramesh Haj. Could you please unmute and ask your question? Yeah, thanks, Javier. And thanks, Cassie, for a great presentation. Um, it, was, uh, it was really interesting. And uh, I guess I have two questions. Um, the first one related to the last um, testing that you showed where you looked at um, the sod specimens, uh, where you had wrap and virgin materials uh, mixed together. Um, I thought it was interesting, kind of the black material that apparent uh, recycled binder that you were seeing looked to, like you were seeing that just as the binder kind of alone. Um, but I was wondering, did you observe any kind of um, 
like cut rocks where the binder was along like a ring along around the outside of the rock um, because that's how I imagine unmobilized binder would be right. Yeah, that's an excellent question. Uh, we have seen that, but it's very rare compared to these clusters. So uh, our observations thus far really suggest this clustering phenomenon um, is largely responsible for incomplete blending in the mix. I think when we get good contact between the binders, um, given the, the mixing procedures we have in place, they tend to blend quite well, but uh, I don't think we're breaking all of our, our recycled material aggregate clusters apart. And we're not the first to, to speculate that clusters are important, by the way. The literature uh, also has several accounts of observations of these happening. No, thanks. Yeah, and I, I completely agree, actually. And I think a lot of the reason for that is is uh, chemical incompatibility as well between the wrap binder and uh, virgin binder. So no, thanks for that. That that's uh, that's really helpful. And then I guess the the second question was pertaining to the um, to the uh, linear amplitude sweep um, work that you guys did. I think uh, this is an area I've worked a lot in. So this is uh, this, it was interesting. Um, at, to see your presentation and I guess finally kind of see it from the beginning um, of the evolution. So, so that was really good. Um, but I guess I was wondering with that test, um, did you ever think about running that in a different geometry maybe? Because you know you talked about some of those effects that the eight millimeter plate has, but things like the Conan plate or other kind of geometries for that? Yes, so the, the, the limitation of the Conan plate is you have a fixed gap for a given cone angle. And that really limits the range in shear rates and shear strains that you can apply to your sample. Um, so based on our most rheometers in, in place today, I don't think you would have the torque capacity to do something like an LAS test with that geometry. Now, I've also seen in the recent literature a, a proposal of a hollow plate geometry, which is kind of an intermediate means, right? It doesn't completely solve the gradient, but it makes it, it less large. And so I think that maybe is something along those lines offers a more practical solution where we could still uh, achieve a wide range of conditions given our current uh, rheometer uh, capacities. Um, also the sticking point in terms of um, our interpretation of the test results uh, is really the nonlinearity. So um, the extensive, more extensive testing that's required is, is to isolate that from damage and not really account for the radial gradient. Uh, we can account for the radial gradient uh, if we have a clear understanding of the undamaged material characteristics uh, quite well by integrating over the, the radius to the total torque response. Um, so in my opinion, the real sticking point is the nonlinear viscoelasticity. Great, thanks. Yep, thank you. So the next question will be from Puneet. Puneet, you can go ahead. Uh, thank you, Professor. Uh, this was really nice presentation. A lot of learning, a lot of uh, topics like which I'm working on were uh, kind of touched upon. So I have a couple of questions. First, uh, first regarding the aging. So I was wondering, like the aging model uh, you presented, uh, that uh, climate aging index model. It, it shows that it is dependent on pavement temperature and uh, as a function of depth. So are you uh, uh, like at your research, like are you considering the effect of uh, UV or moisture by any chance in those? Because I mean, I, I mean, they do have some effect in terms of aging the materials, but I'm not sure how, how much they uh, contribute to that. And do you have any plans to continue to investigate that area? Uh, so the work that we did in NCHRP project 9-54 focused on thermal oxidation. So okay. we did not consider um, UV oxidation uh, or um, any moisture impacts on the, the rate mm -hmm. of oxidation. Um, and I mentioned that uh, we used a depth of six millimeters and yeah. not being right at the surface. And that's the reason because we didn't inherently account for that. And mm -hmm. the shallowest depth at which we could extract uh, our binder from the field cores is really that six millimeters. So um, th that's a great point. I think at the surface, UV oxidation certainly contributes, but it wasn't something that um, we considered in the 9-54 project. Uh, just a follow-up question on that. Uh, I saw that the, the, the relationship between log of G star that was used to, the, to kind of uh, validate the model, right? If I'm not wrong, I think in the... So I was wondering like, uh, that 
just G star was kind of showing the relationship, but like, especially when we deal with the polymer modified binder, especially like, do you think that phase angle would play a role or let's say binder chemistry would play a role in kind of validating that model? Um, so in the 9-54 project, uh, we used uh, the log G star at 64 degrees Celsius and 10 radians per second as our aging index property for calibration. Mm -hmm. uh, we put a lot of thought into to coming to that conclusion to use that as an a AIP, what we refer to as aging index property or AIP. Um, the reason we chose that was we found aging is most sensitive. Um, the binder is most sensitive to aging uh, at high temperature uh, conditions. And so we found if we match the rheology at that condition, uh, the rheology uh, at other temperature and frequency conditions tend to match well. Uh, both in terms of phase angle and in terms of um, the, the modulus. Um, and so we had to choose something to index against, and we felt that was um, the best. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Professor. That was okay. very nice. Thank you for the good questions. <clears throat> Lama, you can go ahead. I think you have a question. Yes, I have a question. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, so I have one simple question. Um, in the first part about the PAV, uh, uh, you, I think that I understood that you concluded that the PAV does simulate uh, field uh, aging for some climates. But how did you do that using only correlations with loose samples? Um, so our, uh, when we developed the laboratory long-term aging procedure for asphalt mixtures under NCHRP project 9-54, we decided to age mixture in the loose state rather than the compacted state for several reasons. Uh, the first is speed. Um, when the mixture is in a loose state, uh, it ages much more rapidly than in a compacted state. Um, and the other was to achieve uniform properties in our aged asphalt mixture. When you age in a compacted state, the asphalt mixture ages most at its periphery, uh, where it has full oxygen exposure, and it ages less at its core. And the objective of 9-54 was to develop a long-term aging procedure for performance testing and prediction. And for performance testing, we want our mixture specimen to have uniform properties throughout it. And so uh, we felt that the loose mix aging procedure best achieved that. Thank you. Yes. Okay, so I have a couple of questions. So I'm gonna I'm gonna take my chance now before anybody hops on before me. I was curious about what you mentioned last in the section in the second section, the section about the LAS, that you were talking about choosing a temperature to test for our more aged binders. And I was wondering how would that look like because I would think that we want to fix the temperature to say the temperature of the field and then test at that temperature? Why would you think of changing a temperature? So, so I agree. I think it should be a function of the climatic grade. But I think if we go to a refined aging procedure, the critical temperature to reflect different climatic grades might be different than the average in the low P, average of low and high PGs minus four that we found worked pretty well for uh, the standard PAV procedure. Um, also, another thing that's noteworthy is um, we've successfully uh, applied time temperature superposition within the SVECD model framework to allow for predicting uh, fatigue properties under variable temperature um, conditions using fatigue test results uh, at a single temperature combined with time temperature shift factors obtained from linear viscoelastic characterization. Um, so it may be we should best select our test temperatures to ensure we get the right failure uh, mechanism, and then we use that means to, to translate across temperatures. Um, Thank you. And I have a I have another another couple of questions. How would we go about separating nonlinearity from damage in the in a DSR kind of test? So I don't think you can do it in one test alone. The, I think the challenge is you need multiple tests 
where uh, you can start to reconcile differences among different uh, the different tests uh, by looking at uh, damage growth using the SVCD model to parse that out, uh, and then attributing the rest of the difference to the viscoelastic nonlinearity. And that's what we've done in, in our analysis. So we essentially calibrated uh, the SVCD model using time sweep test results. And then we could use that in combination with LAS test results to say how much of the response was due to nonlinear viscoelasticity and how much was due to damage. And then we verified we could uh, use that generally to predict uh, the response under uh, other loading scenarios outside of the calibration. Okay, and I have one last question. I, I understand the use of the SVCD model for predicting the performance of binders, but shouldn't shouldn't we aim for something a little bit more simpler to rank binders? Yes, I think that's likely very possible. I just think it gives us the best tool, at least to start with, <laughs> to understand things in a more comprehensive way. And then we may be able to take that and what we learn by studying a wide range of binders uh, and develop maybe a, a simpler index or something to use for, for use in routine specifications. Uh, if we go to something that's traffic based, however, uh, such as um, like we have in ASHTO M332, we may need some lever to translate uh, along different conditions. And I think the SVCD model, or at least as a basis, gives us some lever to do that. Okay, thank you. Thank you. I'm going to give a little bit of time to see if anybody has a, another question. Uh, if you, uh, Javier, if there is no more questions, I have just a question. Please go ahead, Puneet. Professor, uh, so Puneet again. Uh, I, I was uh, I was really fascinated by the work about uh, titanium dioxide, which you uh, guys carried out for uh, finding out the blending of the recycled material in the virgin binder. So I was wondering, like, how do you foresee the application of this? Because, uh, like, how can we, can we, you know, based on looking at the uh, recycled source, can we comment on how will they, you know, how will they blend or what is the blending uh, capacity? Because based on the wrap, this changes. So now looking at this, does this blending ratio remains constant for different type of wrap or what is the range you're looking at? I mean, how can we use it further to ensure if you're making a mix that this wrap source will blend well? Or something like that. Yeah. So first off, I don't envision EDS SEM ever be implemented as a routine uh, type of, of tool in practice. But I think it gives us a research tool to better understand um, how material factors and production factors affect blending and asphalt mixtures. That may allow us to tailor our, say, material processing parameters to achieve better uniformity in our asphalt mixtures. And if we study a wide array of mixtures, we can probably get reasonable assumptions, maybe not perfect, um, but at least some more reasonable assumptions um, for use in practice. And maybe they vary somewhat by uh, material. For example, I'm pretty sure RAS uh, blends a lot less than RAP typically does. So maybe we could assume at a minimum differences for uh, the different types of recycled materials we're using. Thank you, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you again. Thank you for the presentation. It was really interesting. So thank you, Professor Castor, and I think we don't have any more questions for now. I see your email on screen. If, I, if anybody has any more questions, you, of course, can email Professor Castor. Um, that was a very delightful presentation. I really enjoyed it. I'm really fascinated with the work you presented. Thank you again for presenting in the Kent seminar. Thanks, everybody, for joining, and we'll see you next week. Thank you, everyone.